What's, What's up? Good? How you doing? I'm in the place to be, man. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. I know it's probably nighttime where you're at. You're in Europe right now? Yeah, yeah. It's 10 p.m., you know, a 10. little after 10. Got the right. clock in the background over my head. <laughs> no doubt. Like six I said, hours. I got you by six hours. It's all good. Like I said, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate it. No problem, man. Um, you know, I'm here to offer my my help, man, and I'm happy with what you're doing, reaching out to a lot of the hip hop pioneer legends, just hip hop in general, man. And I like your baseball cap. Thank you, sir. PE. Yes, Is sir. Is it the Pirates or, or Public Enemy? We go with Public Enemy today. That's the mood I'm in. <laughs> okay. Um. This is episode 37 for everybody joining us. I have the legendary Rhyme Syndicate member Donald D in the building today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah. Before we get into your history and what you got going on now, can you tell us how the people of Europe and how yourself is uh, are reacting to the injustices going on right now with police brutality around the world? Wow, man. We, we reacting just like everybody else, man. You know, to some it's shocking, but to most... It's not because we done seen this picture many times, you know, play out as a rerun. So, yeah, people in Europe are, are hurt and devastated. I think some people in Germany has been protesting. And, you know, it's just sad that in this day and age, especially the 21st century, 2020, we still getting the same nonsense from the police treating us black men like we're uh, invisible, you know, just to see what took place with uh, Brother George Floyd in broad daylight is, is shocking because, you know, a lot of this was behind the scene. You know, I done went through living in L.A. when the Rodney King thing happened. I saw how everything was being burned. People was protesting. You know, I was around when the situation happened with Ice-T, with the situation with Warner and his his song that pertained to what's going on today. So, yeah, man, it's a sad situation, you know. 2020 since January has been a devastating year, man. Absolutely. Right. Um, any thoughts on what is the next step or what can be done uh, uh, going forward with uh, what's going on now? Well, I don't think, you like, you know, everyone is screaming for convictions of these four policemen, but it goes back deeper than that to the way back. You know, it has to be justice that to make up for all of that, not just at this moment, because if they take it to just this moment, it's going to continue to play out again and again and again. So I would like to see that, you know, things change. And, like, if everyone put forth love first, then it will be no nonsense of this kind of violence taking place and innocent people dying. And also, not just with the police brutality, but also as black men, the black on black crime. See, right now it's been silenced because of the coronavirus, so it, ain't, it hasn't been so many black on black crimes with gang members. So if it can stay peaceful like that, once this pandemic ease up, I would love to see that, man. You know, stop the violence, stop the killing, man. Absolutely. Well, we got about 50 minutes to cram your history all into this small yeah. package because Instagram likes to cut us off after a certain period. But I Unless think we you can. <laughs> yeah. But I think we can do it. Uh, you got a long history, and I definitely want to get some insight on uh, everything that went on throughout your career. Uh, can you take Thanks. us back to where you were born and raised? Well, I was originally born in North Carolina, but never lived there. I was back, I was moved to New York as a three-month-old baby. So all I know is the Bronx, man, you know. So New York, New York to the fullest, to the heart, where hip-hop started. What was the day in the life of Donald D growing up? Man, well, if you know how New York was back in the days, it was like a poverty-stricken abandoned building infested with rats environment so it was not a pleasant place to live but we as youth made it the best that we could so we went out and played street games you know whether it was stick ball ring olivia kick the can and run shooting the water from the fire hydrants 
or just, you know, being kids in, in the Bronx, man, we did what we could do, man, to survive. Um, what were some of your earliest memories of being in the Bronx and, and, and getting uh, in tune with hip hop? What were you saying and, and what made you pick up the pad and pen around this time? Well, uh, I grew up in a household of music, so basically it starts with my mom. She playing all those Motown classics, you know, James Brown, Sam Cooke. So, you know, I fell in love with music by listening to what she was playing around the house, but also not just that soul music because radio back then didn't play a lot of the artists I mentioned on radio. So we heard a lot of the white artists, whether it was Paul McCartney and Wings, the Beatles, you know, uh, Paul Simon, and some of those groups back at that time in the 70s. So that's what sparked me, that music. But as time went on, me going into the parks as a youngster and seeing Cool Hurt was basically the first I saw do a party at a park called 129. So that sparked the interest, but not to be an MC, just to be part of that scene of seeing the dancing and the breaking and the graffiti. So it would take a few more years before I sparked my brain to want to be a part of that movement. You uh, got involved with the Universal Zulu Nation. At what point did you get down with them? And well, why was it so important to be uh, affiliated with them around that time? Well, I mean, my hip hop journey starts with being in a group called the Asalam Brothers. Now, it was a group that was formed by a DJ named DJ Rashid. And basically, as kids, we used to go to a place called the Ho Avenue Boys Club. And that was a place that kept us off the streets and gave us something positive to do. We had a lot of positive role models teaching us the right way to be, you know, not being into street life, gangs or drugs and all of that. So to get into this boys club, you had to have a membership. So we would go there and we play basketball, go on swimming and all that. So I had a good friend of mine that I grew up with named Easy AD. Now, Easy AD would later become a member of the famous Cold Crush Brothers. So for all of y'all out there that don't know who the Cold Crush Brothers are, do your research. They played a big, big, big part of hip hop history. So me and Easy AD was friends. So we played on the same basketball team. So basically to get into the boys club, you had to have a membership card. And there was a guy who sat at the, at the door and he wrote down your number when you came into the, to the boys club. But this guy will have a big boom box and he will have all these break beats playing. So basically he was a DJ cutting up all these break beats. So one day he just basically asked me and Easy AD if we knew how to MC. And we basically said, yeah, not knowing how to really grab a mic and, and rock on a beat. But we said, yeah, and basically that's where it all started with the Asalam brothers. What can you tell us about the funk machine? Okay, so the Asalam brothers did not have a long lifespan, basically. It probably went, I could say, probably five months the most because the DJ basically moved back to Jamaica. So him and his family moved back to Jamaica, and me and Easy AD didn't have a, a, a crew no more. So in the community where I live called Lambert Houses, which was a project, which also... Sha Rock, the first female MC in hip hop history, lived in that project. Raheem from the Furious Five lived there. Tony Tone from the Cold Crush Brothers, and there was a few other groups like the Eminem crew. So basically, there was a jam going on in the center, and this female heard me MCing, and she lived in my building. So basically, she was like, I want to introduce you, introduce you to my boyfriend. And her boyfriend turned out to be DJ Africa Islam. Her name was Kim Anderson, AKA MC Taste, or Taste, basically. So through her, I met Africa Islam. But to get down with the funk machine, it was not like a free ride. I had to go try out for the group, me and EZAD. So basically he had already had two MCs in the group, Kid Vicious and LJ. So we went to DJ Superman house and we had to rhyme our way into the group. DJ Jazzy J was on the turntables and me and Easy AD basically rhymed. 
And they basically liked me, and they didn't really like what e Easy AD rhymed about. So I became an official member of the Funk Machine, and that inducted me into being part of the Zulu Nation. Nice. How long did the Funk Machine uh, play out? I mean, I, they were already around as a different name before I got down. They were called the Mayberry Crew. DJ Africa Islam, Superman, DJ Ed LaRock, and MC LJ. So they had already had, I, I want to say they started around, could be 77. So basically, I'm starting with them in late 78, could be going into 1980. So I had probably a two-year span. So what was funny was I used to go to all the Bronx River jams and watch Africa Bambada and the Soul Sonic Force and all of them at Bronx River, Pow Wow, Globe, and, and Biggs. And I used to stand on the opposite side of the rope. So once I got down with them, now I was on the same stage as Lisa Lee and, and, and all the other Zulu Nation MCs. So basically, for me, it was like a dream come true. Where does uh, DJ Chuck Chill out fit in the scheme of things around this time? <laughs> wow, you've been doing your homework. So basically, <laughs> th this guy stages. So basically, I'm in the funk machine, and we're doing a lot of parties, jams. And at that time, I'm still in high school. But my dream at that time was to try to become a professional baseball player. That was my dream. Baseball, you know, was my love. I also played basketball, played basketball at that time with some players like Ed Pickney, who wound up playing with Villanova, Fred Brown, who played at Georgetown with um, Patrick Ewan, Chris Mullins. So a lot of these basketball legends I kind of grew up with and played basketball with. So... As time went on, the funk machine broke up, and then hip-hop wind up moving out of the inner city of the Bronx, you know, Manhattan, Harlem, and Brooklyn, and Queens, and it made its way into the downtown scene. So back in the day, the downtown scene was basically all about the disco scene, Studio 54 and Roseland Garden and places like that. So one, we could not afford the clothes to get into these places, plus had the money to get in them. Plus, we were too young to get inside those kind of clubs. So once when hip-hop got into a place called the Roxy's, we started going down there, and when Africa Islam basically became the resident DJ, I, got, I came down there, and I would be the MC when he was DJing. So from that, we started a radio show called The Zulu Beat. Africa Islam, DJ Red Alert, and I. So we were up there doing that. So I used to do live rhyming over the airways while Islam either played the beatbox or he cut up breakbeats. And the CEO of Entertainment Records heard me rhyming and basically came down to the radio station and asked if I wanted to make a record. So basically, I thought he was going to make a record with me and DJ Africa Islam. So then he basically told me, now nah, I have this idea of a group called the B-Boys. And it would be you and a DJ named Chuck Chillout. And I was like, Chuck Chillout, never heard of him. So basically, I went and talked to Africa Islam. I said, yo, Iz, this guy want me to make a record, but he's not trying to let me and you do it. So basically, Islam was like, yo, go make this record. And when you make it, come back and bring it to me and I'll play it. So that's when my recording career started. And I went in the studio as the B-Boys, me and DJ Chuck Chilla. Uh, was your first 12-inch uh, cut in Herbie? Yeah, so basically 2-3 Break, Rock the House, and Cut and Herbie was basically the first three records we did. Well, what kind of reaction it funny did because It was funny oh. because when we went in the studio, I didn't know how to make a record. So basically... The producer was telling me to write my lyrics in bars. And I was like, what is that? Because back then when we did parties and we rhymed, MCs rhymed 32 bar raps. And we kept going. It was never, you know, breaking it down to eight bars or 16 bars. So basically, he told me, like, listen to a Temptation songs. They sing eight bars of verse, eight bars of chorus. So that's basically how I wrote the song Rock the House. And 
the rest is history. And Rock the House is one of the most sample musical phrase lyrics in the history of music. Rock the house, y'all. And <laughs> no two doubt. three break. What kind yeah. of reception what kind of reception did you get off off of off that off those twelve inches? They were good, man, because that was, at that time hip hop was still growing. You know, there was you know, Sugar Hill Gang had already Previous years brought out Rappers Delight. You had the Furious Five, Treacherous Three, Crash Crew, Funky Four. A lot of them groups had already released records. So, time we came on the scene, also the Soul Sonic Force with Planet Rock. So when we came on the scene, basically, um, it was a good reaction. Uh, we started doing a lot of shows around town. I remember at that time we did a show with LL Cool J. Had I Need a Beat, and also. Um, New Edition had Candy Girl out. So basically, that was the first show me and Chuck Chill Out did as the B-Boys. So what eventually happened to the B-Boys? So basically, after those three records, Chuck Chill Out wanted to go solo. So the, the owner of the company wanted to, all, to make the group more like what Run DMC was, bring another MC in the picture. So I had first tried one homeboy from around my block named The Original Mark. And we went in the studio and did a rap version of Cutting Herbie and also a back and forth version of Rock the House that was never really released. And then the company didn't really like him. So I brought in another friend of mine's brother B. And then that worked out and we went in the studio and recorded Stick Up Kid, Girls 1 and 2. So basically, those songs was, was hits for us. We got to tour around the states with, you know, groups like Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick, Sparky D, the Boogie Boys, Bad Boys, whatever the groups that was out at that time, we got to do shows with. So those songs blew up. So basically, it was a plan for us to do an album from the success of those records. But all of that got put on hold because... Entertainment wound up putting out a, a record called Pee Wee Dance with Joe Ski Love, who was another MC artist from our neighborhood. And basically that song took off and he forgot about the B-Boy. So we basically never went back and recorded another song because from there he wound up bringing in Keith Sweat. Um, uh, what was the group? Too Hype. Um, Dougie Fresh had put out some records on the label as well as DJ Red Alert. So it was basically the, 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 the fault of the record label basically broke up the group because we was ready. Is this the point where Donald D uh, goes solo? I mean, it, it, it's a funny situation because we was officially still signed to entertainment. So he basically was like, y'all, you know, y'all not allowed to record music no other place. But my whole issue was like, yo, we never got a, re a royalty check from y'all. And you talking about we still under contract. So basically, Africa Islam, along with another brother of ours named Van Silk and them, was putting out music under a, a group called the Zulu Kings, which had Melly Mel in it, Ice-T, Bronx Style Bob, Grandmaster Cass. So basically, I was not on none of them songs because I was not allowed to record music with any other uh, company, but the longer this thing went on, I just got fed up and was like, okay, what are you going to do? Sue me? And I just went about my business and started recording music with other people. So I wound up putting out a 12 inch in 87 called Outlaw uh, slash Dope Jam on a label called Rock and Hard Records. Right. What, uh, what reaction did you get out of that? Was there a uh, bidding war at this point for Donald D? Yeah, so basically, it's, it, the story is, is crazy because at the time when I was with Entertainment, basically, they were not allowing us to talk to no other people. So I remember there was a, a lady named Heidi Smith approached me at a party, and she worked with Rush Management, which was Russell Simmons' company. And she basically asked me, did we have, man have a manager? And I was like, no. So 